Hello everyone, and welcome to day 11 of the 131 project. Uh, today we will be covering chapter 10 of Ecclesiastes together. Uh, my name is Joe Chung, and I'm, rel I'm relatively new to City Light, having arrived in Korea only this past August. As the, as the uh, COVID situation improves, I really hope to uh, meet more, of, uh, more people here at City Light. To start off, let's read Ecclesiastes chapter 10 together, uh, and I will be reading from the NIV version. Ecclesiastes chapter 10. As dead flies give perfume a bad smell, so a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. The heart of the wise inclines to the right, but the heart of the fool to the left. Even as fools walk along the road, they lack sense and show everyone how stupid they are. If a ruler's anger rises against you, do not leave your post. Calmness can lay great offenses to rest. There is an evil I have seen under the sun, the sort of error that arises from a ruler. F fools are put in many high positions, while the rich occupy the low ones. I have seen slaves on horseback, while princes go on foot like slaves. Whoever digs a pit may fall into it. Whoever breaks through a wall may be bitten by a snake. Whoever quarries stones may be injured by them. Whoever splits logs may be endangered by them. If the axe is dull and its edge unsharpened, more strength is needed, but skill will bring success. If a snake bites before it is charmed, the charmer receives no fee. Words from the mouth of the wise are gracious, but fools are consumed by their own lips. At the beginning their words are folly, at the end they are wicked madness. And fools multiply words. No one knows what is coming, who can tell someone else what will happen after them? The toils of fools worries them, they do not know the way to town. Woe to the land whose king was a servant, and whose princes feast in the morning, Blessed is the land whose king is of noble birth, and whose princes eat at a proper time, for strength and not for drunkenness. Through laziness the rafters sag, because the idle hands the house leaks. A feast is made for laughter, wine makes life merry, and money is the answer for everything. Do not revile the king even in your thoughts, or curse the rich in your bedroom, because a bird in the sky may carry your words, and a bird on the wing may report what you say. Personally, I have often had a difficult time understanding the Bible's wisdom literature. Now, these passages are intimidating, dense, and uh, might appear difficult to contextualize. However, when I was younger, I wish I had studied it more closely because wisdom literature provides excellent advice for Christians who are trying to navigate careers, relationships, and other important concrete challenges. Sometimes people ask, what is wisdom? And what is the difference between wisdom and knowledge? According to Pastor Tim Keller, Wisdom isn't really like obeying the Ten Commandments where the rules are clear. It is the ability to know the right answer or choice when uh, it isn't obvious. Knowledge, on the other hand, is information. Wisdom allows us to interpret knowledge optimally. I've often heard that knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit and not a vegetable. Wisdom is knowing that it shouldn't go into a fruit salad. Today's passage talks about the nature of power or authority. In the previous chapters, the author spends time discussing things uh, that don't make much sense about life, including things like accumulating wealth. In this chapter, the author explores the nature of power and authority within the broader context of the meaning of life. I think the author explores this topic distinctly because wealth isn't necessarily everyone's goal. Not to say wealth and power are mutually exclusive. On the contrary, they are interlinked and many people pursue both at the same time. Certainly, people who work in large corporations tend to do this. However, wealth and power are distinct. I have observed that careers in business, uh, compared to government, tend to attract people with different kinds of interests, and some people really love the trappings of influence or power uh, much more than you know, having a lot of money. Actually, pastors are not exempt from the temptation regarding power. One of the criticisms of large churches in Korea these days is that it encourages pastors to compete with, uh, with each other in order to climb the church hierarchy and achieve power and status, and that, it, that, and that this desire for advancement consumes pastors rather than the desire for God or um, helping others. Now, one thing I would like to make clear is that climbing the hierarchy in whatever calling the Lord has called you to is not necessarily a bad thing. This chapter clearly explains that problems happen when unqualified people achieve positions of authority. The best thing for any society is when people appointed to positions of authority, whether in government, 
the private sector, and especially in the church, are qualified and mature. For those who want advice for how to climb these ladders of hierarchy, this chapter, as well as other wisdom literature in the Bible, provides very sound and concrete guidance. But what the author clearly wants us to do in this chapter is to is this, to examine what power and authority you know, look like in real life. And does it make sense to worship it? Does it make sense to base one's existence on the pursuit of power and influence? Broadly speaking, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 10 tells us three major things. From verses 1 to 4, it tells us something about the nature of wisdom within the context of power relationships. Verses 5 to 19 talks uh, a lot about the problems of power in, in the world that we live in. And verse 20 talks about the danger uh, that people face uh, when, when they face power, uh, particularly if power is directed against them. Uh, firstly, uh, the nature of wisdom. Now, the author makes it clear that the difference between the wise and the foolish, this difference is very obvious. It is as obvious as the difference between um, perfume and the smell of a dead fly. In fact, uh, it is so obvious that uh, you can see it when people walk down the road. Wisdom, or, you know, or foolishness for that matter, uh, is something that emanates out of one's character. Uh, it is part of your makeup. People are not wise because they are able to ape you know, wise sayings or, or, or um, you know, ape others in terms of trying to do wise things. Uh, rather, um, uh, wise people, um, you know, they do wise things, they say wise things because they are wise. It emanates out. And, um, and uh, wisdom uh, is, is something that's really powerful. In verse 4, the author tells us that wisdom uh, and, uh, can really help you in a pinch when, even when you're uh, facing an angry king. And we have to remember that you know, back in the old days, um, that uh, societies were uh, organized uh, by uh, basically um, uh, monarchies that, um, th that were you know, all powerful and you know, they could, kings could order people to be executed. And so this was often a scary thing, um, you know, back in those days, much more so than you know, perhaps today with, uh, you know, different uh, styles of government. Uh, the second thing that the author talks about quite a lot uh, is uh, regards, you know, the, the problems of power. The problem with power in our world is that uh, so many people uh, who uh, wield it are really, really unqualified. And the author goes on and on about this. You know, anyone who's had a minimum of work experience understands what it's like to have a boss who's lacking either competence, you know, character, or sometimes both. You know, bad bosses are a scourge of uh, the world that we live in, and uh, this text shows us the source of some of these problems. You know, sometimes this laziness could be immaturity, unseriousness, boastfulness, or pride. How does one deal with this problem? One problem with bad leaders is that they use their power to accomplish foolish things rather than helpful things. This passage even says that bad leaders order ditches to be dug that they themselves will fall into later. Now, history is replete with these kinds of examples. For example, in the book of Esther, Haman builds a large gallows on which he intends to hang his enemies. In fact, what ends up happening is that um, he gets hanged on them. Another problem with uh, bad authority is that it is um, inefficient because poor leaders lack skill, they use more resources than is necessary, um, and they lack the sense of timing to bring success. And um, I think across the world and even in Korea, many people often complain that the ineptitude of their bosses causes them to stay at work late or work on weekends. Lastly, the author talks about you know, the, you know, the power of danger, uh, the, danger of uh, the danger of power. The passage says that wise people are very careful in terms of how they approach others uh, who have power or authority. Even if you hate a person of authority in your private thoughts, it can be obvious to others. Complaining out loud about them will only confirm this. In, in corporate culture, it is dangerous to criticize bosses even with people uh, you think um, you, know, you're, you are close to. These things uh, tend to leak out. Uh, then, w then what does this passage you know, really imply? It implies that you must take control over your own attitudes regarding people in authority. If you ever meet anyone who has successfully climbed any hierarchy, whether um, business, church, the army, uh, civilian government, the nonprofit world, you know, name it, uh, they tend to tell the same kind of story. And the story kind of sounds like this. What they say is that it's not the bosses that they really love that tested their mettle, 
but it's how they uh, worked and handled boss worked with and handled bosses that they didn't like or respect. Those experiences really would uh, really forged them into mature people, and also shaped their reputations. Now, years ago, I had a boss I wasn't getting along with um, at the time, and um, I thought about quitting. You know, while I was praying, I felt the Holy Spirit give me a message that I really didn't like, and the message was basically one word. The message was submit. So I started demonstrating meekness instead of rebellion. And uh, my boss appreciated the change in attitude, and it's a relationship that improved a lot. And other people noticed it as well, and brought it up to me in private, and it was good for my reputation at the firm. In fact, uh, later when I asked the company for a raise, the boss strongly stood by me, and, um, and that meant a lot to me. Uh, for those who are concerned that, uh, that they uh, might lack wisdom to navigate the, you know, the power structure you know, around them, you know, if you belong to Jesus, uh, my encouragement to you is not to worry. James 1.5 says that if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. All right, let's pray. O oh Lord Jesus, teach us not to worship power and authority here on this earth. Rather, we affirm that you are the ultimate power and ultimate authority, and it is by your design that power in our world in our society rises and falls and is maintained. Give us wisdom so that we may redeem the fallen nature of authority in our world until you come again to complete the work that you have entrusted to us. And it's in your, your name we pray. Amen.